Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Sebastian Berka, the Senior Associate Director of the Global Center, and we're happy to continue today our mini course with, with Paul Tucker on Global Discord, the International Economic Order on the Fractured Geopolitics. Thank you again, Paul, for joining us. Today's uh, second and final seminar topic is Basic Order, the International Monetary and Financial System Meets Security. Please note that uh, Paul's new book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World Order, is available for sale outside the classroom, and he will be available to sign them afterwards. Before we start, please note, we are on the record and live streaming, so please silence your phones, but feel free to use social media. As usually, uh, views expressed by our guests are their own, not those of the Sickler Center or the University of Chicago. As you may know, the Sickler Center promotes and diffuses uh, research on regulatory capture and the various distortions that special interest groups uh, impose on capitalism. We have uh, many initiatives, including our podcast, um, Capitalism, co-hosted by our faculty director, Luigi Zingales and Bethany McLean, and our online publication, promarket.org. Um, please check them out. <clears throat> Back to this afternoon, we look forward to hearing more of Paul's insights. But before we begin, please allow me to briefly introduce him. He, Paul Tucker is a research fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School and a senior fellow at Harvard's Center for European Studies, among others. He spent over 30 years in central banking in various senior positions and was knighted by Britain in 2014. He also served as chair of the Systemic Risk Council and as deputy governor at the Bank of England um, at the center of efforts to contain the financial crisis. He also served as director uh, at the Bank of, for International Settlements and on the steering committee of the G20 Financial Stability Board, among others. His previous book uh, is on central banking, the state, and democracy, and we, we hosted him for a mini course on it as well in 2018. Uh, the video is on, on, on the Sigla Center YouTube page if you'd like to see that. Um, and now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Paul Tartar. Sebastian, thank you very much. And thank you, Sebastian, Rachel, and Diana. They are thanks, Luigi. Um, Luigi, I have to you know what the administration looks like. Um, and, and you have got a great team. And I am one of my flaws is many flaws is that I am not good at giving praise. And your team is really, really top notch. Um, so thank you very much. They made it very easy to be here and a pleasure to be here. So, given the way Sebastian introduced me, um, I'm going to talk about the parts of my book, Global Digital, that, that bear on the international monetary and financial. System. And you might think, oh, well, this is getting closer to how he spent 30 years of his adult life. And I think the answer is only superficially. Um, you know, we didn't spend much of our time thinking about the connections between the international monetary system, the international financial system, and security. And yet, actually, it's those connections I'm going to try to bring out. And I guess we didn't spend our time doing that because the connections didn't matter. Um, so much then. They were always in the background, which I will make obvious, I hope, um, but they kind of weren't in the, in the foreground. To remind you from yesterday, or for those of you that weren't here yesterday, I see over the next coming decades, two, three, four decades, three possible scenarios for the geopolitical order. A lingering status quo, where the United States remains top dog, and international regimes and organizations continue to be designed and operate in its image, each power struggle, the contest between the two great superpowers, the US, the US allies and friends, and the People's Republic. A new Cold War where the superpower struggle leads to considerable recoupling, um, proxy wars, tensions, agility, uh, mistakes, <laughs> and a restructured world order in which peaceful coexistence is maintained by some kind of balance of power among a broader group of states. And there's no suggestion that getting to that last phase would be um, easy or, or comfortable. Um, so yesterday, I, I, I think I closed by suggesting that there was a remarkable episode in the 1970s 
that brought out the connection between the international monetary system um, and and security. And this this episode is kind of in the mid 1970s, the, the Vietnam War and the expansion of the welfare state here, which was kind of in some ways um, a necessary um, set of measures to maintain stability in this society, um, given um, the country was at war for a long time and a war where it wasn't doing terribly well and a war where lots of people, lots of young men especially, but young women as well were dying. Mm -hmm. um, that was putting, both of those things were putting strains on US finances. Um, President de Gaulle asked of France, asked at some point during the 1960s um, if the dollars France was holding could be converted into gold, um, which was um, a commitment the United States had entered into under the Bretton Woods Treaty that added to further strain um, on the US. The Bretton Woods regime, and potentially even the dollar at the center of the world international monetary order, unraveled. Um, First of all, in slow motion, and then in super fast motion, in the in the beginning of the in the early 1970s, there was a there was a fabulous moment. I, I, um, I'm not going to get the words exactly right. Um, in the as this was happening, as as people scrambled around, including um, people I came to know well, um, scrambled around to build a new monetary order, and there was something called the Smithsonian um, Agreement, and. I'm going to get the quote almost right. President Nixon said, this is, this is the most important monetary initiative in the history of the world. I think he actually put it slightly more strongly than that. Um, I, I can't remember whether it lasted for two months or one month. But this, this pinnacle of monetary achievement was a fleeting um, moment. And there was no regime. There was really no new monetary regime in, in the world or more importantly, in a sense, in this country domestically, um, because the dollar was no longer tied to gold, and the US then spent the best part of 10 to 15 years trying to find a new way of maintaining um, low and stable inflation. That That's a kind of Paul Volcker contribution to this country and in a sense to the, to the world. But during all of this, Pan and Germany are um, arising fantastically well after their reconstruction um, after the Second World War. And there is great nervousness um, about, about whether the dollar, great nervousness in Washington, whether the dollar will remain at the center of the system, um, which had been written into the Bretton Woods Treaty, but the Bretton Woods Treaty no longer really operates. And so mission goes from Washington including, I think, the State Department and the Treasury Department, certainly people from the foreign policy side and the, and the economy side, goes to Saudi Arabia, and there is basically a deal that the United States will continue to provide a security umbrella for Saudi Arabia in the form of arms and all, all, all the things that go with, with the security relationship. And in return... Saudi Arabia will continue to invoice oil in dollars. Um, and the significance of that is that if they invoice in dollars, um, other people will have to pay for it in dollars. So other people will need dollars. And having been paid for it, Saudi Arabia and others are sitting on a pile of dollars, which they will then need to invest in global dollar-denominated capital markets. So, so whoever is is I, got, I don't know, and I never got around to asking Paul Volcker whose idea um, that mission to Saudi Arabia was. But whatever one thinks about it normatively, um, positively, it was an extremely shrewd thing for the United States um, to do to underpin the role of the, um, of the dollar. And th this isn't, the connection between security relationships and the use of the currency isn't, isn't at all new in the 19th century and into the 20th century, um, even after the British Empire was 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 unraveling um, and countries were gaining independence, London went to great efforts to ensure that countries continued to use sterling um, as their currency or as their main um, reserve currency. 
Inaction all also goes the other way. I'll un unpack this a bit in a second. That to the extent that your currency is used as a reserve currency, and certainly if it's used as the main reserve currency, um, then it will be cheaper for you to sustain kind of security apparatus um, investment in, in arms and defense, et cetera, um, that you need in order to be the security um, hegemon. So there's a sense in which the unknowing headquarters of US leadership is the Federal Reserve Building in, in, in Washington. Now, why that connection going from reserve currency to, to security hegemon? The, the, the normal list of things, which is true, um, I think isn't as significant as something that I will add. I'm not the only person to add it, but I want to emphasize it. The first is you get some senior rich people, hold your banknotes around the world, Banknotes don't carry um, any interest. Um, there is some kind of annuity type income from that. More significant, um, dollar interest rates and capital markets tend to be lower, both for um, government and for US dollar-based multinational corporations, which makes it easier for US multinational corporations to operate as well. Um, slightly differently, it's also easy uh, for the U.S. bank to operate around the world because all banks run liquidity risks. Multinational banks run liquidity risks in lots of different countries, currencies. If, if the currency you can borrow from your home central bank is the world's reserve currency, it's pretty easy to exchange that, to borrow dollars from the Fed, and exchange that in capital markets, foreign exchange markets, for any currency that you might need if you are short of dollars, euros, dinars, yen, um, renminbi. Um, so having the Federal Reserve as your, as your liquidity backstop is as potent for US banks as having the Bank of England as um, it, their backstop was for British banks in the second half of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century. But, but I think there's an even bigger um, thing. Um, it isn't often remarked on in scholarly circles. I think it's pretty well understood in policy circles. Someone that has remarked on it is a man called Benjamin Cohen, who's up in Canada. And the best way of conveying what this is, is think about the collapse of the US and indeed pretty well global financial system, certainly Western financial system in 2007. Lots of U.S. banks collapse. Lots of U.S. shadow banks collapse. The mortgage market is in a terrible mess. It's obvious that bankers are are on a spectrum of incompetent, um, venal, um, lazy, thoughtless, and so are the people kind of regulating them. Um, and I'm deliberately layering it on. So this is kind of really bad, really bad. Um, the U.S. is the epicenter of this world crisis, what you would expect in those circumstances from a normal country is that there would be a bit of a run from the currency, and in particular, a bit of a run from its government bonds. We saw this with my country a few weeks ago, a budget from a briefly lived government that didn't go down very well. People sold government bonds, sterling um, fell. What happens um, at the various kind of downwards um, lurches of the crisis in 2007 and 2008, there is a run into US Treasury bills and, and other short-term US um, bonds. So just as the US government needs to support the economy through the automatic fiscal stabilizers and other measures, the cost of their borrowing goes down. And it doesn't just go down because the Federal Reserve is cutting interest rates. It goes down over and above um, that because there is a, a, a run into the most liquid assets in the world. So this is a fantastic cushion. I mean, what it says is that, that even if you are overwhelmed with temporary incompetence and, and are the cause of a disaster, you've got this cushion um, that helps you navigate through it. Now, any aspiring superpower 
um, would be crazy not to want that advantage. Um, and we can be sure that people in Beijing um, will want that advantage. It would just be really strange for them not to want that um, advantage. Get, getting there is another matter, but of course we should expect them to want it. Anyone would um, want it. I think the other thing that I will say um, at this point, and perhaps we might c come back to, is I think yesterday I might have mentioned swap lines. Yes, I did. I, I mentioned that the Federal Reserve refused India a swap line in 2008 or 2009. So part of the atmospheric backdrop to that is that in the history of these swap lines in the United States of America, Congress um, has, has generally been rather nervous to negative about the Federal Reserve providing swap lines all over the world. And one can think of a very simple reason for that, which is if, if, if Luigi is running a country somewhere and they've got lots of dollar activity, then, and I don't provide him with a swap line, then he's probably going to have to hold more dollar foreign exchange reserves. And that's quite good for me. If I provide him with a swap line, he can economize on his um, dollar reserves. And you can see how that leads to a, lends itself to a polit political argument. Um, you're providing these risky credit lines and you're disincentivizing them holding dollars. That's, that's, that's bad um, for us. So, so I think, although people in my old profession, central banking, have often been frustrated with the congressional attitude to Federal Reserve swap lines, I think one can make sense of it in terms of where Congress is coming from. Um, I think this will completely change in the next um, generation. I think there will be a competition between the Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China to provide swap lines. Because by providing a swap line, you you make it easier for a, a, a state, another country, to use your currency um, in its capital markets and its money markets and its and its trading relationships and in its its commerce. And when I thought this was perfectly sensible and reasonable, when a few years ago, while I was still in office, in fact, um, um, when when the Beijing became interested in promoting use of the renminbi, um, they actively went around the world talking to people about entering into swap uh, with them. And I think the UK um, did that. I think there was a swap line between the Bank of England and the um, People's Bank, although obviously I'm happy. Day. And I think there'll be more of that. And I think the Federal Reserve will become more liberal and will be encouraged to provide dollar swap lines in this game of promote your currency and depend your own currency. So there is a huge, I mean, huge value to incumbency um, here. Because of the network externalities and other such things um, that support liquidity in dollar capital markets, um, liquidity in dollar um, foreign exchange markets, um, in the invoicing of, of commodities and other things um, like that. And it's quite hard to undo um, that. You don't, you don't switch from invoicing in dollars to invoicing in X casually. The, when, when you occasionally see stories about um, a country these days, typically China is having conversations with a country, another country about invoicing in renminbi or moving away from invoicing in dollars, you, you, you should think of that as one of the most significant stories you will read that month. Um, it, even though most people that will pass over the headlines and won't realize it's, um, it's significant. If one starts off um, with the incumbent's advantage, what do you have to do? Well, I guess one of my themes is, well, you have to avoid mistakes. So you, you have to maintain low and stable inflation. People aren't going to want to hold dollars around the world if they think its value is going to fluctuate all over the place because you've lost the credibility um, of maintaining low inflation, hence all the concern in the mid-1970s. 
you're, you're similarly going to need to maintain a stable banking system to the extent that your banking system has tentacles um, everywhere around um, the world. You, even with those advantages, you're going to have to maintain confidence that your, your public debt and more generally your external debts are sustainable into the medium and long run, which is something to do with the credibility of your institutions having the capacity to, to meet adversity and adjust and, and change course when, when necessary. And, and all of that is kind of pretty familiar stuff in a sense. If you, if, if you, if you went to one of Luigi's or Luigi's colleagues, um, lectures or seminars in the econ department, they'd say that kind of thing, this kind of subject. It, it has clear political implications, though, and implications that may not be recognized, which is the US is embarking again on one of these phases where it has a great debate about great debate in Congress about the debt ceiling. And the debt ceiling debate is always conducted as though it's uh, inside the beltway game between the party of government and and the party um, with the with the majority in the in the House or the uh, the Senate, as though it's entirely of domestic um, significance. And I think that was basically true um, during that short period when American hegemon hegemony was was unchallenged and accepted in many parts of the world. I, I don't think it's remotely true now. Um, I think that people playing the debt ceiling game, they're, they're in, they're in the grown-up um, phase now. This isn't domestic politics in one country. It happens to be a big country, the United States. This is people around the world. Well, if they can do that, if they actually messed it up around the world, people still have reduced our as well as one or two percent, some a bit more, um, some a bit um, less. The same goes for shadow banking. Um, the I don't want to get too sidetracked by this, but after the crisis, the banks were re-regulated. That create, made sounder, carry more equity capital, they have to carry more liquidity. That created incentives to shift banking-like activity and banking-like fragility outside of de jure legal banks into other things that have the economic substance of banks, but not the legal form of banks. All this was completely expected. There was meant to be a policy dealing with it. There hasn't been. It's happened. Um, there will be there will be more stumbles. Whether there'll be a crisis, one can't possibly know. But there are vulnerabilities all over the place. Um, shadow banking operates in dollars around the world. The Federal Reserve is ultimately the international lender of last resort for the dollar-based shadow banking industry around the world. And the more it the more it ends up having to provide dollars under duress, the more it feeds a moral hazard type problem of, of people being bailed out and therefore not being um, prudent. And so again, I feel that those people who lobby against making the shadow banking industry safe and sound, they actually don't have the long-term interests of the United States or of the Western Alliance in mind. I, I do not mean that they sit down over breakfast and think, how can I harm the United States? They, they, they don't do that. Well, some of them might, but I doubt uh, very many of them at all. Um, it's that the funds come in, they've got campaigns um, to, to fight in the, in the, in the future. Um, this all seems unnecessary um, regulation. And yet, actually, it makes the very fabric of, 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 if you like, dollar-based hegemony um, more, more fragile. So the stakes get higher. And there, there isn't a, a nice economist, including friends of ours, write papers where they find a number where you know, this much expansion or this much debt or something is, is too much. No one knows what those numbers are. You just know that they're out there somewhere. And, and that you know that there are limits to how much, how much you can lever up a nation's balance sheet, even with all the magnificent advantages um, that this country has. Now, almost finally, digital currencies. 
Now, this is not about crypto of the kinds that's been going through um, the newspaper recently, which I think is probably going to be a major subject for social psychologists in the years um, ahead. Um, th this is about the prospect of, of central banks um, issuing their own currencies in digital form. Of course, the first thing to say is that most money is already in digital form and has been in digital form for, for decades, but the cash we carry around obviously isn't um, digital. But there's a kind of an excitement around this that beggars belief in a sense, given that as though the word digital was somehow created in 2015 or something, whereas um, we've had electronic central bank money and private money for about 30, 40 years. But, but this is about um, cash being um, dig digitalized. And there is one form of it, which would be an absolutely profound change in ways that would play into the geopolitics. Um, and I think some variant of this will happen. So the first thing to say is the architecture of the money credit system hasn't really changed in 250 years. People are always saying, oh, there's been this massive change in the monetary system and, credit system and another massive change. In terms of its basic architecture of central bank at the pivot and then a layer of really big banks, what this country calls money center banks, what my country calls clearing banks, and then a layer of medium-sized banks, and then a layer of what in my country in the 19th century were called country banks, and then businesses and us people. And as you might bank with a small bank, the banks with a big bank, the banks with the federal reserve. That basic architecture has existed since at least the late 18th century. And the significance of the late 18th century was that the first person to write about the lender of last resort, though he described it in French, was Francis Baring, who was the founder of Baring's Bank, now defunct, and he wrote with a quill pen. Um, so this is before the steam engine, um, and his essay is worth reading, by the way. And throughout the 250 years or whatever since, basically that architecture has remained the same. Politics around it has changed, but the, and the economy has, has been transformed. This could, digital currencies, could potentially massively transform that. And it would, the, the most radical would be, well, I'm going to replace um, cash note that you have, which is a claim on the central bank. Um, instead, you will hold a digital account with them that's positive balance most of the time, but in dire need, they could let you have an overdraft. So this is a world in which all of us bank with the central bank. And that's a world where, where um, there isn't much bank privacy from the state. The state knows everywhere you are spending your money on everything. Um, where the state can use social sanctions by your um, bank account and where the state, um, to the extent that the, the state central bank, the state credit bank absorbs um, the functions of the private banking system directly or indirectly, um, it can steer the allocation of credit in the economy. Um, that's what it would mean if we all that, that would be a possibility. All those things would be possible if we all banked with the um, central bank. I'm not saying any of that with approval or disapproval. So far, changing mode, if one comes to the Western tradition, that is all those three things are against our traditions. The whole, the traditions of banking secrecy embedded, first of all, perhaps in the common law and then codified in civil law countries and here during the 19th century are partly about protecting um, the privacy of our how we spend what resources we have, great or, um, or small. And that credit allocation should go on in the, in the private sector. Now, there's, we could talk about 
where the central bank should be on this, that's a different subject in a way. What I think is interesting about this is that if you're in Washington or London, you you probably think, exaggerating a bit, well, we don't want any of those, any of those changes. We want to kind of hang on to some things. But if you were thinking sitting yeah. in Beijing, you you might think, well, actually, that'd be fine. You know, we have to think about whether it's the best idea. There are other ways of doing this, but it's not. It's not kind of. Um, kind of a, a problem in terms of the role of the state in that kind of, of society. So if I talked about a competition in swap lines, if there is a competition in digital currencies, this will be a competition with kind of almost modes of life, modes of, of politics, potentially. So this is, this is above the pay grade of, of central banks. If a central banker in the Western world said, actually, I think it would be okay if the general public um, all banked with me, the central banker, I would say, well, I don't know whether that's a good idea or a bad idea, but it's a really, really objectionable idea that you decide. This cannot possibly be decided by the chairman of the Federal Reserve or the president of the European Central Bank or the governor of the Bank of England. This has to be, I'd even say more than that, can't even be the prime minister or president of the day. You actually want bipartisan support for what would almost be a change in the a constitutional type change in the structure of the um, economy. <coughs> Let me finish with some sweeping remarks about two international um, organizations that are involved in the at the center of the. Um, international monetary and financial system, one the IMF, um, one um, Basel. And in my book, there are chapters on, uh, there's kind of two chapters in a sense on the IMF, one chapter on, on Basel. Um, neither organization faces sclerosis of the kind that the World Trade Organization um, faces that I described yesterday. Not everybody has a veto at the IMF, and a certain, not, certainly in Basel, not everybody has a, a veto. The IMF has another problem, which is the lingering status quo of US European leadership is codified into the Constitution. Um, the US and the EU have the most votes. The, the, the US can veto nearly all major policy changes Europeans, if they vote together, can veto almost all um, policy changes. The votes that China has and India has been increased, but not nearly enough to put them on anything like um, parity. In some senses, this is palpably unfair. Um, in other senses, Washington has almost zero incentives to, to acquiesce in a change, um, given the problems that I was discussing um, yesterday. The IMF, in some respects, is the organization that most obviously captures, well, the post-war world was built um, in the image of the United States because the Soviet Union chose to completely decouple into a separate, into a separate zone. It, it isn't at all clear what the solution to this is, short of a new world order, and I don't see one that coming for a long um, time. In the meantime, for reasons that I hope I set out with some care in the book, I think it's quite important that the IMF doesn't become um, or continue to act as a vehicle for effectively imposing the Western way of life on other countries. Um, the, the most terrible example of this is in the late 1990s when lots of East Asian economies, South and North, there was difficulty, they needed support from the IMF. Um, this support is always accompanied by conditions. There's nothing unique about East Asia in that respect. Conditions were imposed on my country when we went to the IMF in the middle of the 1970s. But in some of those cases, in particular Indonesia, um, the IMF kind of went beyond its, its brief in that they didn't just say you need to make these fiscal changes or these monetary changes something that would deliver um, external financial stability for, the, for Indonesia. But 
said, we won't give you these resources or lend these resources to you unless you restructure various of your markets, including the spice markets. Now, this was, fun. This was first of all, fantastically insensitive um, because various European states have conducted wars against each other to grab the most precious um, spice islands in the 17th and 18th centuries. So that's kind of Portuguese, Dutch, and, and um, British. Um, but quite apart from the insens insensitivity, the insensitivity matters. Quite apart from the insensitivity, it's an extraordinary conceit to go around the world and say, you should organize your economy in the way we organize our economy. Even if one sincerely believes that they will grow at a faster rate if they organize themselves um, in the way that Britain or the United States or wherever is organized, France and Germany. Um, it's not obvious to me um, that it is sensible to say you should, you should organize your economy to be more like us. Why can't a country choose to have lower growth um, but maintain its way of life? A bit more complicated than that in the Indonesian case because some of the monopolies were held by the children and relatives of the then president and so uh, was tinged with corruption. So I think the IMF faced difficult judgments, but I think they made some poor judgments in the difficult situation in which they found themselves. After that, um, I mean, the IMF was hugely criticized in East Asia, which led to the build-up of foreign exchange reserves in East Asia, um, but not just in Asia, in East Asia. Um, economists um, from the right and as well as the left here criticized them. Uh, a man called Marty Feldstein, who was uh, the founder of the MBR and, and well, the kind of the driver of the MBR, if you like, the headquarters of World Economics in Cambridge, Mass, the professor at Harvard, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. He, he ran an incredibly important piece criticizing the IMF. So criticism came from everywhere and they retreated um, from trying to impose our way of life on other parts of the world. But the instinct hasn't gone. It's slightly unfortunate in a way that the example I'm going to give now is from my own country. Um, I'm not giving it because it's from my own country. So if you, it must be a month or so ago now, Britain has this kind of slightly symbolic budget uh, and all hell lets loose in capital markets. And the IMF releases a statement. And the statement has two components. It says, this is very bad for inequality, and therefore it's bad. Um, and this is going to mean interest rates um, are, are going to have to be higher. Monetary policy is going to have to be tighter for a while than otherwise. So what's interesting about this is they don't say what they should have said. They say something that's completely obvious about monetary policy that didn't need saying. They say something about inequality, which I might agree with, or not, but has absolutely nothing to do with them. Um, Britain is still a kind of reasonably functioning democracy um, and actually ejected the government that, that enacted that or tried to enact that, that budget. But it revealed an instinct to tell people what social choices they should be making. And then they didn't make the one, didn't, didn't make, um, the point they should have made, which is you've done all of this. You've said nothing about what your longer term fiscal framework is. Um, you, you plainly need to do that. Countries need fiscal frameworks in order to lend credibility to the difficult spending and tax decisions that they have to make. Um, we welcome the remarks of the last few days that you're now planning to have one. We look forward to discussing it with you. Um, th th those are my thoughts and the five seconds after I saw the IMF statement, and I thought they still haven't learned. It wasn't remotely as significant as Indonesia. I don't, think this, I don't think the IMF statement affected anything in the UK. I think in that building, there are still people who think they can get up in the morning and tell other people how to organize their societies. And they should, it just shouldn't. Um, not least because it distracts them from doing the thing that they can do, which is where are the risks to global economic and financial stability, which don't depend on social models. Um, they depend on rather more mundane um, things. Basel Tower has a different um, 
set of challenges. It, I ended up thinking the puzzle was rather more interesting than perhaps I'd understood when I was when I was chairing groups there and sitting on groups um, there. It it operates via soft law rather than hard law. Um, it 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 works on a a series. There's a core group, and then a inner group, and then an outer group of countries. The membership of those countries has changed over time. So in in over history, um, the core of Basel was the group of of ten countries. So think North America and Northwest Europe. Um, it's now fourteen. It's not called the G20. It's called the Economic Consultative Committee, and it contains um, China, India, Mexico, and Brazil. I think. Um, it's a nice sign to myself that I've forgotten some of the details of it. Japan was added sometime in the in the eighties. All of that's good because it's soft law because it isn't all coded into a treaty. They can be um, more flexible in adapting to the world. They face limitations. One of the biggest issues in finance is cyber. Um, I can't imagine going to a meeting and being prepared to talk about cyber in front of Russia and China. I think it would be equally the metric, be equally crazy for them to talk about cyber in front of in front of France and Germany and the United States. Um, that's a problem, and the laws of war and peace don't really cope adequately for when a cyber attack is an act of aggression. Um, but there is another problem, which is related to domestic um, politics, which is, exaggerating a bit, Basel has a more intimate relationship with big finance, with the big banks and the big asset managers than it does with civil society. It's, it's easy for it to look like a branch of Davos, um, and not just because Davos and Basel are both in, in Switzerland, but because there are meetings behind closed doors with bankers and asset managers, and there are not equivalent meetings um, with people um, in some sense representing or speaking for consumers and users of, of finance. And I think they have to, I think they have to solve that problem even if it's only having the meetings with the bankers live streamed. Um, or if they're not going to do that, which is, I think, what I would probably do if I were them. Um, if they're not going to do that, then I think they need to have as many private meetings with civil society as they have with finance. So what I've been trying to convey, the details of the economics and finance don't matter for what I've been trying to convey. What I've been trying to convey is this all becomes more difficult. Going off to Basel and and debating a capital requirement for banks or going off to the IMF and thinking about a program for um, a country going through a difficult economic financial period. This is all much more difficult when in some sense, everything is a move in the greater game, peaceful coexistence or not, whether we can find a new modus vivendi for great powers, whether we can celebrate um, the rise of, of China without feeling vulnerable, whether China can rise and feel proud of its, of its history without feeling overly hemmed in, how to be interdependent but not over-dependent to the point where we are neurotic about each other. And every single area of policy has become a lot more difficult than when I was in office. Thank you. <laughs> it's very good having a talk at the back, by the way. It um it gives the it creates the illusion that one can speak to time, whereas actually one is speaking to a deadline. <laughs> so a question for you on uh some of the recent recent sanctions against yeah. Russia. We saw Russia banned from or certain Russian affiliates banned from using SWIFT as a yeah. payment trans transactor. Do you see that having effects on international trade in the future as people back off from trade, knowing they can be cut off suddenly and severely? I think there are two things. So did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Um, I think there are two things here, which is um, the use of SWIFT 
and the other sanctions, financial sanctions that were put on um, Russia. SWIFT became part of, if you like, the weaponization of economics, I'm going to say around a decade ago when it was used in the complex of sanctions against Iran. And kind of sweeping generalization, I would say that elected heads of government were keen on this. Finance ministers, treasury secretaries, net keen about it. Central bank governors a bit nervous about it because central bank governors understood that a Pandora's box was being opened and what could it be used for. It, um, it sparked efforts to create alternatives to SWIFT certainly involving Russia and China, but in Europe as well, um, in complex ways that it's easy to misunderstand. Europe doesn't have quite the same instinctive feelings about Iran um, as the United States, partly because it didn't go through 1979 in quite the same, in quite the same way. And some European companies um, either wished or did, I can't remember, continue trading with Iran um, for a while. And the U.S. Um, exercised, if you like, extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, so that if you, if you and I are in Australia, and I buy something from you at a, sh in a shop in, Aus um, in Australia, but in U.S. dollars, eventually, my banks, 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 and your banks, 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 banks will settle with each other across the Federal Reserve, and so the U.S. claims. Um, jurisdiction. And I was once in a G20 meeting, G20 deputies meeting or something like that. Doesn't matter. Anyway, that kind of China were in the room, Russia. Um, some of the United States Treasury was on my right. Some of the US regulators were in the world. And I said, um, and they, they were pushing this, the, regul the US regulators were pushing this. And I said, you know, just as now, if someone in Manila trades with um, someone in Melbourne in dollars, um, and they're both domiciled outside the United States of America, um, the United States claims jurisdiction over parts of the transaction. So you have to think about how you will feel if one day um, somebody in Milwaukee trades in Renminbi I didn't name him, but I just said it in another currency with somebody in, I don't know, Massachusetts, um, Mississippi, um, and another power claims jurisdiction. And I said, we have to be very careful tiptoeing towards a world where all the great powers are claiming jurisdiction over everything everywhere in the, in the world. So I think the swift thing is partly a technical manifestation of that broader problem, and there isn't an easy solution. I think something else happened with Russia this year, which people were terribly surprised by, or at least the newspapers wrote up as they were terribly surprised, because I'm not in office, I have no idea whether they actually were surprised or not, um, which is that um, the Russian state foreign exchange reserves were frozen in their various jurisdictions. And my response when I saw that was, oh, I wondered what the threshold for that was. But of course that can be done. Um, I mean, of course, res reserves are held in places. The Soviet bloc held their dollars in London, and I think to a lesser extent in Vienna and Paris, not in the United States. I have never looked into this, so I don't know. That can only be with Washington's consent. It seems to me unimaginable that, that Washington were strongly objected to London um, doing that. And actually, for those of you who are interested in finance, part of the development of the so-called Euro dollar market um, in the late 1950s, early 1960s is because Soviet dollars were held in, um, in London. Um, but they have to be held somewhere. Um, gold is physically somewhere and it can be seized. There are, there should be high thresholds for doing that because you are basically seizing the external surplus or part of the external surplus 
of another country. But the threshold is finite. It's not infinite. There are th and this, again, is an area where the, the, the world of economic policy making, making meets the, um, the world of law and peace. I mean, implicitly, although it didn't go through the international court, um, there was one case that went to the international court. Um, there was a judgment that Russia was committing an act of aggression, which is illegal in international law. And therefore, if not formally, then informally, then that made part of the case for seizing um, Russian assets around the, around the world. And, you know, the history of warfare is full of, of blockades and seizures and and the subsequent development of conventions to try and draw some lines. And we're going to have to do a lot more of that line drawing um, for the cyber world. That's, by the way, why in the book you'll find material about war and peace. In your speech, you mentioned about the special benefits and enjoyed by the reserve era currencies. People's Bank of China has been pushing international internationalization of RMB uh, for a long time, uh, but with limited success. And in fact, and we actually see that the pre-financial crisis euro is actually at the, in thirty percent or forty percent of the uh, trade invoices actually that denominated by euros. But after the financial crisis, the importance of euros seems to also that they are uh, are diminished quite significantly. So it seems that they, the dominant uh, position of the US dollars is actually more important now than. Uh, it, it was, it was. So I wonder that they, uh, uh, whether that they are also using one of these uh, that the, uh, the digital, yeah. digital banks, uh, central bank currencies, and where the PBOC has been, and they are also experimented, they, I think, and they more far ahead than with uh, them, uh, Federal Reserve, uh, Federal Reserve uh, of the United States. Um, you do see that this is this as another opportunity for people's bank of China to, uh, to international as I mean, and and uh, my second question is for, as, as for the end game, what do you see that they could be? Can it be the case and they are, they are actually two dominant currencies coexisting or it has to be one? Thank you. Um, remind me if I forget your second question, although I, I don't think I will. Um, so I think it, in terms of the taking the simplest thing first, I think on the Euro, the reduction in its holdings proportionately is because of the euro area crisis, which made the euro area look um, fragile. Assuming they don't revisit that, or in some sense fundamentally cure it through some kind of fiscal union, um, I would ex actually expect that to change over the long run. You imagine a world in which, um, I'm not predicting this, but imagine a world in which um, euro area inflation is low and stable. Um, US inflation goes like this, Chinese inflation goes like this, the proportion of euros in international reserves will go up. Um, I mean, it's the, 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 in the Western world, Germany and then the ECB have a better record in maintaining low and stable inflation than the Federal Reserve. Um, that has occasionally, that, that against in the context of sometimes strained relations between Europe and the United States has sometimes led European leaders to want to build the euro up as a reserve currency. This links back to the previous question as well, in a way. Um, I frankly think that's a mistake. And it's a mistake that however frustrated European capitals occasionally are with the United States, the truth is, we have outsourced our defense to, to the United States. And what we get in return is more leisure time and a greater proportion of our GDP goes into stuff that we consume rather than military stuff that is used to protect people. And what, what, it's an interesting question, what the US gets out of that, what US leaders get out of that is the prestige of being the most important people in the world. And I suppose and hope, and it's only sustainable if it's true, uh, American citizens get out of that some sense of pride, but that would take us into a debate about. And I, and I think European leaders occasionally, when they're talking about building up the euro, um, forget that um, we got a. This is in chapter eight of the book. We got a very good deal out of the um, um, post Second World War. 
of settlement and really well to remember it. Because remember, Europe is easily rich enough to become a superpower again. Easily rich enough. It just wouldn't be a terribly sensible thing um, to, to, to do. It would require some political changes and so on. Um, I think it is what I'm going to say about the Renminbi people often present as absolutes, and I don't think there are any absolutes in this area. It is harder to become an international reserve currency without full convertibility and free flows of capital out of the country as well as into um, the country. The, one, one should be a bit modest about making assertions like that because we haven't got many examples to go from. We've got the dollar in the United States and we've got sterling and, and Britain, but there's no doubt that sterling, in some senses, we all still live in a slightly mid 19th century British world of relatively free trade and relatively free um, 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 capital um, flows. And I have little doubt that those were um, very useful in the, um, the rise of British power during the late 18th century and, and 19th century. And I think that's harder for China. Um, and I think there's a very interesting um, reader quote here from the world of economics and monetary stuff and currencies. to some kind of basic, again, 19th century um, ideas of of, of Western ideas of liberty, if you like, which is I'm fed up with being in this country. I'm taking my resources out and I'm going, uh, which is a, that's a kind of very 19th century British attitude that I'm going to take all my resources out of this, this country and go elsewhere. That's not where mid 20th century Britain was, by the way. There's no, there's no civilizational point here. There's a point about where countries are at different points of, that's more that's more awkward for China. When Britain was declining, um, and this will bring me back to the Renminbi, kind of tried to use its the remnants of its empire to put a ring around what's called the Sterling area, basically compelled or induced people to carry on using um, Sterling, which in this particular one for India in really important ways are not you know, not terribly good ways in some respects for, for India. Um, the interesting thing I think about the, the Renminbi becoming a, a reserve currency and a digital reserve mm -hmm. currency is can China promote the use of the Renminbi in sufficient places outside of China that there's a kind of Renminbi offshore market that is, that is vast in itself even though there isn't a frictionless funnel into the mainland and out. And I think some people kind of dismiss this as an impossibility, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't dismiss that um, as an impossibility. I think it is not easy to imagine two rival reserve um, currencies. And this is for economic reasons, not for political reasons, which is the network um, benefits of using one currency are so great that there's some kind of tipping point, which is, oh, this is just going to be cheaper if we do it, if we denominate it in X. And that's why I think that the invoicing of the world's most important commodities is important for, for that. And, you know, there's I, my own personal researches on this aren't as complete as I would like them to be. There's a, one of the reasons there's a mess in the Middle East, always, is because after the demise of the Ottoman Empire, my country, the United States, are competing well into the late 1950s for who's going to have most influence. No longer trying to rule the Middle East, which is who's going to have most influence in different parts of, of, the, um, of the Middle East. So they, crudely, Saudi was kind of more of an American sphere. Aramco was kind of tied to the US. Um, Persia, Iran, more of a British sphere. 
CIA arranged a coup. We acquiesced in in the early 1950s, partly tilting Iran um, away from London, a bit towards Washington. This this feels to me way above my pay grade. I came back to that. Yeah. And that's the point. <laughs> uh, Paul, what you just mentioned uh, regarding the euro dollar market, what you just mentioned regarding the euro dollar market, right? Do you see, given what's happening now geopolitically, outlines? the new reserve dollar market happening if these two systems may become uh, co not complementary but competing systems if they if they if they become blocks right. oh yes then yeah absolutely you see that? Yeah, if it, it's oh, like that's one of the scenarios it has to be it has that that you get you get some decoupling because neither wants over dependence that that needn't be a hostile thing. That's a kind of just in case market. Yeah, and you can actually imagine that being a friendly conversation. It's a kind of friendly but nervous conversation. We don't want to be over dependent on you just in case you turn out to be. And we actually, we expect you not to be over, want to be over dependent on us in case we turn out to be, you know, not especially friendly. That can all be done in a. And and then the question is, so but does that get out of hand? Something that worries me, not my field. But something that worries me is the lack of de-escalation protocols between um, Beijing and Washington of the kind that existed between Moscow and and Washington. I think these are tremendously important things. I suspect this is a wild guess that when recently in the Ukraine war, a missile did go into to to um, into the Ukraine, Putin's remarks were so measured. I thought, oh, wow, this is the language of all that kind of stuff that's done so as to avoid um, falling into outright conflict by mistake. But there is more room for mistakes, I think, at the moment. And so you can imagine more economic decoupling. And the more economic decoupling you get, then you can imagine um, separate currency zones with a funnel between. There was a funnel. I described the funnel essentially in London, but in Vienna and Paris between the Soviet bloc and um, the Western bloc, oil going in one direction, dollars going in the other, and then dollars back, of course. Uh, but yes, that could, that, could, that could happen. But I don't, you know, if I go back to where I began, and then I think we must round up. Um, I don't think this, I think this is just going to go on for ages. I think it's going to go on for a century, unless there is some kind of decisive social dislocation in one society or the other. China's got, you know, it's a magnificent country with a rich history, sense of identity, uh, critical mass and more or less everything now. And obviously the West has that. So, I mean, it is a bit like France and Britain. It took uh, a long time. And actually the way that became reconciled eventually is Britain actually started to absorb certain other values of French Revolution, and France started to absorb certain British values of constitutionalism. And that was in super sandwich. And there were periods when it looked as though it's going to happen next week, all this nice stuff. And then it was all bad again. And I think that's what this will um, be like. And in some respects, the fact that ultimate destruction is possible in this world makes, makes proxy wars of an economic kind and a physical kind slightly easier to conduct, which is not, which is an unhappy um, note on which to end. So I won't end on that uh, <laughs> note. I will end on um, this note. We're lucky to live in a world where we have Chinese civilization, Sanskrit Persian civilization, Western civilization, and some others um, as well. And if, I mean, that is, it's such a lucky thing that it's impossible not to be hopeful about where this will go in the long run because of the rewards to each of us individually from getting to share in each other's different parts of the world's civilizations. And that is what has always happened in the end. Thank you very much.